So lab is going to be a very different kind of feel from from the lecture in that there's going to the, I, there will be times when I'm kind of talking to you and describing background information and things like that. But there's going to be a lot of it that's going to be you doing things and getting data and analyzing and figuring out what it means and writing it up, communicating it. Um, and also just the kind of basic material is going to be more about the process of science. Like, how is it that we actually know what we know? You know, I'm going to be describing all these different processes in the body, but how do we know that? Where did that come from? How did we figure it out? Um, so part of our lab is going to be looking at that process of scientific discovery and, you know, its strengths, its weaknesses, you know, things like that. I mean, as you go on in your careers, you're going to constantly be getting information about what is the best approach to deal with somebody who has this condition or to do this or that. And you'll probably find it changes. Like, you know, what's the best diet to like, you know, reduce the chance of colon cancer or whatever, you know, what the answer is today might be slightly different than it is like 10 years ago or 10 years from now. Um, so understanding how people come up with these answers and also why it's kind of a work in progress is something I think it's useful to understand at a deeper level. But we'll be doing that in lab. Um, so part of lab will be what we call like these hypothesis driven labs. You know, where we are going to be more about the process of science, you know, coming up with objectives and hypotheses and getting data and analyzing the data and seeing if the data supports our hypothesis or not. So that will be part of this. There's also going to be also just kind of these demonstration labs. Oops. Spell it correctly. that are gonna be more about just demonstrating concepts in a more concrete way that we are learning about in the class in general. Like our first lab, which would have been a real lab, but instead is gonna be a virtual lab on Thursday, this um, chemistry review lab. It's not about actually asking a question that we don't know the answer. You know, we actually are hoping to see things that we expect to see, but it's just a way to notice these things in a more practical, concrete way to make these more intellectual, kind of esoteric concepts more, you know, more real. Like, you know, we can talk about, oh, this kind of compound will dissolve and this won't, and this will conduct electricity and this won't, but it's like, just take the crystals and put them in water and stir them around and see what happens. And it's like, oh yeah, it's true, you know? Or like stick the electrodes in there, meh, it goes buzzing, it's okay. Oh, that's conducting electricity, it's conducting the circuit or completing the circuit. So that's part of the labs are also gonna be about just demonstrating concepts. So it'll be some of that, but then some of it will be more about hypothesis driven labs. Um, and we'll talk um, over this afternoon about, or it's, I guess morning about what is a hypothesis even, and what are objectives and all that and on a more formal level. Um, so that's kind of the big picture of what lab is. Um, I'm, I'm noticing all sorts of little chats. Oh, all right, no, I'll get back to that later. All right, so I can go to the module, let me share. Let's see. La, 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 la. Here we are. 
So this is something you can see, this lab orientation. Um, so this is, hopefully everybody already has bought or is about to get a hard copy of the lab manual. You will need the hard copy because you actually cut out the um, pages of it to be the um, methods and materials in your actual lab write-ups. So here we have lab procedures and expectations. You know, welcome to physiology lab, you know, place to explore lecture concepts firsthand and a place to learn about the process of discovery and science. Um, virtually all scientists keep lab notebooks. Um, we are gonna be keeping lab notebook in this class. Um, it has to be a particular kind. This lab notebook is gonna be ultimately worth a hundred points of your score, which is as much as a major exam. So it's it's worth a lot. You need to you need to actually pay attention to your lab notebook. Um, it's quite a bit of work too, because it's about writing down what you're doing, recording things in a clear way, analyzing what you found and how it relates to what you're trying to understand. Um, I'm gonna talk more about the lab notebook as we continue on. This, this thing, it says, do not collect data on scratch paper. So actually while we're here, maybe I should just, let me stop sharing so you can just see me on the screen. Actually, let me get my actual lab notebook. Hold on. Um, all right. This is a lab notebook. This is what you all need to have. In fact, this is going to be easier if I just get rid of my virtual background, which makes it things keep disappearing. So, all right, lab notebook. A um, few things about this actual physical notebook that you're going to need is it's bound. It's not, the pages don't come out. They're either, they're in there. It's also the pages are numbered. You know, starts with page one, you know, two, three, four. So if you cut a page out, we know it's missing, right? So, and the other thing is it's got this, um, graph paper. So it makes it really easy to make tables and, you know, like, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, right. I can make, you can make tables really easy. You can do simple graphing. Um, this, this is actually my lab notebook that I'm keeping track of my data analysis that I'm doing with the MDMA study. Um, so this is not what your stuff is going to look like inside, but it's the basic idea. You record what you're doing. Notice it's it's pretty, it's not beautifully pretty and beautiful. It should be legible. I have to be able to read it. Otherwise, I'm not gonna know what you wrote. But you're not graded on it being beautiful. You're graded on it being kind of a true and honest record of what you're doing. And then also, you know, kind of a you know, a solid analysis of what it what what your data means. Um People, oh, Emilio is here now. Um, people get really uncomfortable with the lab notebook because it's not kind of pretty. It's more of a raw record of what you're doing. I think a lot of people, especially in, I think school means a lot of times like hide all of this the work you had to get to your answer and then turn in something really pretty and perfect. And your lab notebook is not going to be that. The lab notebook, you know, in science, there is a, a stage where you end up writing a formal journal article, which then gets published and people read, which is all pretty. And, but the lab notebook should, you know, it, it, it's, things get scratched out. Um, yeah, um, in fact, let me, I can show you some like scans of people's lab notebooks. 
Let me see if here. You know, this is an actual, you know, this is actually somebody who has actually kind of pretty writing, but you know, notice they revised their hypothesis. You know, so they scratched out their old hypothesis and put in their revised hypothesis. That's great. You don't lose points. I don't look at this and say like, oh, what a loser. They didn't get it right the first time, right? It's, no, this is the way it works. It's like, especially you know, if you were doing this beautifully, you probably shouldn't be in the class. You know, the, part of what you're doing is learning this stuff. So you're going to write your objectives, your hypotheses, and I'll probably be giving you feedback and say like, that's a good start, but, you know, and then you're going to have to revise things. Sometimes you'll be able to just add in little pieces. Sometimes you might have to just cross the whole thing out and write a new one. Um, when you do cross things out, you put a line through them. You don't obliterate things because you are supposed to have the overall process um, visible. Um, oh, I see Alexandra, you've got your hand up there. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple questions. One was you mentioned that like it's numbered because you would wanna know it, um, if pages were removed. So is, would I'm just curious that like, I don't know, like I spilled my coffee on a page or something, I should leave that page in there. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Great. And second thing was, um, so for all of this, do you want us to then be writing it in pen so that it's. Yeah. Okay. yeah so pen, because again, you're supposed to, if, if it's not, if you're going to revise it, you just put a line through it. Great. Thank you. So, right. And you, yeah. You can see it's not beautiful. It's, you know, th this this person was like an A student and you know there's things that are crossed out they they revise things that's that's normal if you look at any actual real live human being you know their process is not like perfect in the every in the you know you know people do things they revise they make a mistake they put a line through things so a lot of times people get really um, uncomfortable that someone's going to see that they're not perfect, that they're like a human, you know? So uh, all I can say is please try to get over that, right? You know, you're graded on, in fact, you know, it's not good if you, if you um, write something that isn't actually a real record of what you're doing. Um, you can also see just from this that there's, you know, for methods and materials, rather than actually um, writing all the methods and materials, you know, copying them down by hand, that seems kind of a waste of your life. So you'll be able to just paste the methods and materials from your lab manual into the lab notebook to be the methods. Um, all of the lab, um, met, all, the, all the lab methods are single-sided. So, you know, it's, it's designed so you can just kind of cut and paste. This is, I say, this is one of the few you know, college classes where, you know, you can come to school with scissors and paste. Because <laughs> it's gonna be, going to be the way you're going to put in your methods. Um, you know, I'll talk more about kind of the way you put, you know, kind of layout data and things like that. I usually have some kind of, on, when we're in person, I usually have some kind of stamp of the day to just um, kind of double check that you are on track and that things are looking good. Um, you know, that your objective looks good, for instance. Um, we'll talk much more about objectives and hypotheses in just a few moments. Um, other things, you're going to be making graphs. We're going to be using Excel quite a bit in this class. You know, and as you make graphs, 
you'll be able to get them and just paste them in like this. Right, class data that's up, you know, in Excel, which will be posted in Canvas. There's graphs um, of the data. So you can just post all this stuff. Um, another important thing, whenever you do put figures in, you're gonna wanna make sure that the figures have numbers, right? You don't wanna just have orphaned figures because then it's like, well, how does it relate to what you're writing about? So all figures always have a figure number. And then in your discussion, you can say, you know, refer to that figure and talk about how it is related to what you're talking about. The trend line in figure one, which is the entire pool class data, blah, blah, blah. So, right, so just, you know, and there's, there's no perfect right way to do it. There are, this is one of these things, there are wrong ways to do it, but there's no one right way to do your lab notebook. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more about it. It's, so, it's easier in person, but I'll do my best for the first two weeks to make sure you have a sense of what you're doing in this online version as well. And there's a specific notebook for sale in the bookstore that we buy? There is, and you can also get it um, just Amazon. I think it's even cheaper on Amazon. It's like, they're only like 12 bucks or something. They're not that expensive. Um, but it does have to be that bound. In fact, if we, I can, if I go into Amazon, I, mean, I, I can, yeah, I can do it later. Um, but it has to be, a bound numbered graph graphing paper notebook like that. There are a few different brands, but national is like the most common. It's kind of like the Kleenex of the, of the facial tissues or the band-aids of the adhesive strips. <laughs> um, blah blah blah. So these are just labs that you we're gonna be doing. Again, it's Always going to be, again, some of these labs have objectives. So let me talk about the objective of a lab. So let me get away from this for a second. So to talk about, let me look at the time, to talk about objectives, you know, objective is like, what is the question that we're asking with this lab? Um, and it's going to be a question. It should end with a question mark. Um, it should also be kind of clear and concise. Right, the whole point of doing experiments is to answer some question, get some information that you want that you didn't have. Um, so, the better you can get at asking a question, the more of a chance you're gonna to have to actually get an answer. If your question is not really concise and clear and well-formed, you're not gonna know where to start to find out what's the answer to my question. Like, what's the effect of diet on health? It's like, oh my God, where do I even start? What aspects of diet? There's so much, diet is so huge, health. What parts of health? Health is huge. Like, you don't, it's not going to be very useful to have a question like that because you don't even know where to, where to go, what, what, what to look at. So if you ask a much more focused question, like what is the effect of dietary fiber and the um, prevalence of colon cancer? You know, that, okay, I can, I can do that. That's 
focused enough that I can actually get some answer because I know what I'm looking at. I'm look, you know, I know what we're going to talk about in a few moments, the independent variable and the dependent variables. Talk about more in just a second. These need to be very clearly um, kind of laid out. Like, what exactly are we looking at? Like, in fiber versus colon cancer, independent variable would be, you know, more or less dietary fiber in your diet. Dependent, this is a thing we're looking to see if it changes in some way as you vary the independent variable. Like, is the incidence of colon cancer actually dependent on the amount of fiber in your diet, right? So when you ask these questions, you are then going to be able to know what are the actual things we're gonna measure and that we're gonna look for the relationship in between, right? So coming up with this objective, coming up with a kind of clear idea of what exactly are you trying to figure out is gonna be the first step to actually getting an answer. If your question is too vague, you're going to be pretty lost. Um, it can be frustrating. In science, you tend to focus on very small parts of a question. I spent, I spent like about six years of my life in graduate school, you know, looking at hearing, studying like how does the ear process sound. But actually it was like, how does the bullfrog in her ear process sound? Actually it was how does the bullfrog, the sacculus of the bullfrog in her ear process, you know, low frequency vibrations. You know, even there, how does the bullfrog sacculus preserve frequency and timing information as it's measuring these low frequency vibrations? You know, and that was like six years of my life to get one little piece. You know, science relies on lots of different people doing lots of work, looking at different little pieces of the same bigger picture so they can put everything together and create a kind of larger narrative that is interesting. Um, but the reality is most mm -hmm. science it's necessary to kind of narrow things down quite a bit. So let me talk more about independent and dependent variables because that's gonna be critical in coming up with your objectives in these labs is being to really, being really clear of what things are we looking at? What kind of relationships are we trying to explore? So independent variable, typically, you know, try different values of this, move it around. So that's why it's independent because we are wiggling it. We're independently moving it, moving it up, moving it down, see what happens. Then, Look to see if the dependent variable moves in a predictable way. As the independent variable moves. So the dependent variable is the thing that you are going to check to see is it being affected in a predictable way by the independent variable moving. So example, you know, I think in your, in your um, 
lab book, I kind of talk about the example of coffee in test scores. You know, I am curious about the relationship between drinking coffee and doing well on physiology exams. So I could have, I could have a question like, you know, how does coffee consumption affect test you know, performance on physiology exams? You know, so I could even graph it out. You know, exam scores, you know, cups of coffee per day. Um, and I, I could do it with, you know, I know in, a, in bio 110, you talked about scatter plots, scatter plot, just each subject. It's like, oh, there, oh, I should, let me, I need to have, let's say a hundred. I can say, I'm, I'm looking at this. There's Alexandra there. She's drinking like a about three cups of coffee per day, and she got a 95 on the exam. So there's her dot. You know, then, you know, there is Juliana, and she drinks about one cup of coffee to, per day, and she got like an 80 on the exam. There's her dot. You know, and there's somebody, each person, it's like how many cups of coffee do they drink per day and put their dot there? Right, each of these dots is is a subject, is is a person, and then I can look: is there a relationship? You know, is a possibility that the more cups of coffee, the higher the score. You know, what would I call this kind of a this kind of a relationship? If the more cups of coffee, the higher their overall score. Positive correlation. Yeah, that would be a positive or a direct correlation. But I'm sorry, let's say it was it's supposed to be without a cup of coffee would be a higher at all. Wait, uh, different uh, wait, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Say that one more time. I said supposed to be a coffee. Uh, it's supposed to be like I don't know. That could be the number could be changed. I think the 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 the, the, the audio think, is not so clear for me over the. I think because you're on a phone or something, it's harder for me to understand the question. No, I said let's say it's said to be a cup of coffee. So yeah, the person take one I don't know. Let's say ten milligram of I don't know. That's can, can can you write your question in the chat? I'm I'm having trouble hearing hearing you. Can you write your yes, question? That's all right. I, I have to read it. Okay. okay. Sorry. I, I think he was just saying that a cup of coffee was the equivalent to like 10 milligrams of Adderall, I think is what he was saying. Or, yes, he, yes, thank you. Oh, oh so let's so we're not so let, let's stick to our, so what is our independent and dependent variable in this thing here? We're not- The independent is gonna be the cup of coffee. So independent variable is gonna be kind of number of cups of coffee per day. How much coffee we're doing, we're varying that. We're gonna check different values. And then our dependent variable is gonna be the exam score. Right, you know, Adderall affects things, you know, attention, it affects awakeness. I'm sure, you know, people take it as a way to help study and do better in school, but that's not part of what we're asking here. This is part of this idea of staying focused on a very clear objective. So, you know, Adderall would be also another interesting to look at or look at comparing Adderall versus this coffee or whatever, but, Part of what I'm kind of trying to show here is to design an experiment, you need to stay focused on a very limited question. So in my question here, my independent variable is gonna be number of cups of coffee per day. My dependent variable is gonna be exam score. And 
that is now something that I can, I can like look at specifically. Um, we'll talk later about, you know, problems of controlling for confounding variables and things like that. But for right now, let's let's keep it more just about independent and dependent variables. Yeah, and then one possibility is the dependent variable might have a direct correlation or positive correlation. As the independent variable goes up, the dependent variable goes up. What's another possibility? That they go down? Yeah, it could be I have a negative correlation. Um, let me... It could be my dots. You know, the more coffee you drink, the more jittery you can't even hold the pencil because it's like, you know, you know, so maybe it's a negative correlation. So a negative correlation is another, it's correlated, but it could be negative or inverse correlation. So what would we call if at a certain point you get a marginal rate of return on as your cups of coffee go up, your score starts to plateau. So it right. starts off as a positive correlation, right. but then it flip right. the curve will flatten. Right. So that so the reality is there are a lot of relationships that are nonlinear. Um, that is not uncommon, but a lot of things we are interested in do typically do have linear relationships, at least within a limited range that we're looking at. Um, yeah, the reality is it would be very likely that, you know, there is some positive correlation up to a point, and then at some point, the caffeine is toxic, and these people are going into convulsions, and they're definitely not helping them with their exam scores. So it might be something that looks more like that, right? Um, that would be a more higher order curve fit. Like when we get into Excel later on, We'll mainly be doing linear curve fitting, looking just for a linear best fit line, but Excel lets you fit second, third, or even higher order curves to your data um, if that is going to be a, um, a better or more useful kind of curve fitting to try to understand the relationship. So kind of this positive and negative correlation is more about this more the, sim the simplest um, kind of two-dimensional or you know, kind of linear, linear relationship. But there are a lot of times when you'll have higher order curves that are actually a better fit than just a line for the relationship. Um, so what's another possibility? We can have a positive correlation, a negative correlation. What's another really common result you see? Could have no correlation. No correlation. Yeah, it's actually, it's disappointing, but it's not uncommon at all that there is no real correlation. It's like, it doesn't really seem like coffee has much to do with it at all. You know, and again, you don't know until you try. Um, some more things I should talk about here. The idea correlation does not imply causality. So if I have exam scores, cups of coffee, and let's say I have a positive correlation. It doesn't mean that the coffee is helping improve the exam score. You know, I might, it might be my hypothesis was, well, caffeine is a stimulant. And if you're more awake, you'll study more. And if you study more, you'll do better on your exam. So I think more coffee is gonna mean better exams. And I do the experiment and I look and it's like, sure enough, more coffee, they did better on the exams. I have to be careful about saying that, you know, that I understand this completely now because 
it could very well be that coffee has nothing to do with it, at least in a, in a direct way. It could be that people who just study more in, especially in their study groups, do better on exams. Except people who are in their study groups are in these cafes where they're meeting up with their pals and then they feel guilty because they're sitting around there and they want to make sure the coffee, the cafe doesn't go out of business. So they buy more coffee and then they got the coffee in front of them. So they drink it. But what's really important for doing better on the exams is actually just studying more in their study groups. But the people who were studying more in their study groups were spending more time in the cafe and buying more coffee. So yes, people who drank more cups of coffee did more, did better on their exams, but it wasn't causal. The coffee wasn't causal. The coffee kind of came along for the ride, right? It was actually the study groups that was actually the causal thing. So how would you how would you know that? Like why would why would one assume um, that there are other factors involved in the um, causality? So we're gonna talk about the idea of sources of variability. Whenever you're designing an experiment or whenever we're looking at one of doing our own experiment, we're always gonna just brainstorm. What are all the things that might have some effect on my dependent variable that are not the thing that I'm measuring? Right, so, and then you hopefully come up with it and then you can control for it. You come up, you design your experiment in such a way to help convince yourself or convince the people who are evaluating your research that the source of variability was not the issue that what I think is happening is happening. Like there was a, a classic, there was a classic study where People were looking, they're like, your, your nervous system develops based on input. Like if you, um, if, depending on what you hear as, you, as you're kind of an infant, depending on what you see, it actually is important for the actual wiring up of your cortex, your sensory cortex, cortices that are gonna be interpreting the data later on. So people had this thought, like, I wonder if, you know, you know, we kind of evolved under the night sky and now we have like lights on all the time. And I wonder, you know, they're worried like maybe kind of having just incandescent lights on all the time at night mess up kind of people's vision. And they looked at people's, like how, how good people's vision were and how likely it was if it was correlated with the amount of night lights that were on in the house at night. Trying to see like are having more kind of light on in the house at night correlated with having worse vision. And what they found was, yes, it turned out it was. It was a correlation. So they were like, oh, it looks like there's something about having too much light on at night that's messing with kind of normal visual development. And then they looked deeper and found it had nothing to do with it. You know, it was genetics. It was like, you know, if your parents wear glasses, you're more likely to wear glasses. And if your parents' vision is stinkier, they are probably going to have more lights on around because they don't see as well. You know, so there were more lights on for the kids who had worse vision, but it was not about the lights causing the vision. It was about their parents' genes causing the vision and their parents' genes also, you know, motiv motivating the parents to have more lights on around in the house. So, you know, so you gotta be really careful. Um, and again, the main way to try to get around it is try really hard to think of all these sources of variability that might have an effect and then double check that those aren't the thing. And um, we'll talk about, again, more about controlling, controlling for confounding variables a little later. Um, so, 
Are there any questions about what we mean by independent and dependent variable? So like, for instance, next week, we're gonna do the jumping lab. We're basically gonna be, and again, normally we do this in real life and it's actually fun, but instead we're gonna have to, you'll watch a video of Tina and I jumping on, <laughs> um, and then you'll get to analyze the data. Um, but the basic idea of this jumping lab is we are going to measure different body parts, measure your calf circumference, measure your height. In fact, you know, measure weight. And then we're going to measure you know, how high they can jump. Right, so, and that literally is just like standing on the ground and jumping up and putting a mark up on the wall so you can see how high, how high people can jump. Um, what would be independent and dependent variables in this experiment? The weight and the height could be the independent, maybe. And how high they would jump would be the dependent. What is, is there another independent variable here? Calf circumference. Yeah, so in this case, we actually have three independent variables, right? We're gonna look, is calf circumference, we're looking at people with different calf circumferences. Is there a relationship with that measurement of their body and how high they can jump or dependent variable? You can look and or height. Is that related in some way, in some predictable way to how high they can jump or their weight? Is that related in some predictable way to how high they can jump? All right, so in each case, so this is a case where we actually have three depend, three independent variables and one dependent variable. Um, so in this, in this case, would you do a graph for each one? Um, yeah, you, you would have to look at each one independently to look for each of those three different relationships. And in fact, you will be. <laughs> um, so, Let me go back. The thing here, the objective, the purpose, the question that's being asked, it says hint. The objective will almost always be something like, is there a relationship or correlation between the independent variable and the dependent variable? Or what is the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable? Or how is a dependent variable affected by the independent variable? Right, an example, how is student performance on exams influenced by coffee intake? So the objective, which is a, it's kind of the um, initial formative thing that is going to be the basis of your hypothesis driven labs is always gonna be a simple question and it always has to include the specific independent and dependent variables that we are working with. So, you know, so for that jumping lab, if I wanted to have an objective for the jumping lab, what would it sound like? Do people with 
do people, do tall people, can tall people jump high? Would that be a? That's, that's, <laughs> you're, you're on the right track. But if you remember first, there's first there's a few independent variables. There's gonna be three independent variables. And also you are kind of presupposing an answer already. We want to, the, the question should be a little more general. Like a hypothesis is going to be where you are going to think like, well, I think taller people can jump higher or something. But we want to keep it a little more general, asking just about the relationship. Is there a relationship? I have, I does have one. Height, does height determine how high you can jump? Would that be? Yeah, so that's, so that's, that's better. How yeah. about... How about does calf circumference, height, or weight affect um, how how high you can jump? Yeah, that's perfect. It's something that simple, but it has to be. It's clear. It, it has. It's very clearly bringing in the independent variables and the dependent variable. Like, does someone's height, calf circumference, and or weight, um, you know? affect their ability to like vertically jump. You know, and then we can do the experiment. Now we know what we need to measure. We got to measure their height, their weight, and their cast circumference and their jump as well. And then we can look to see if they're correlated, usually by making some kind of scatter plot. So th th does that make sense? Right, so what I'm gonna do right now is give you guys a chance to try to figure that out yourself. So let me get out of this. Let's. Look right back to modules. So if you are not yet in Canvas. I will leave this stuff up on um, the screen so you can you can just read it on the screen. But if you're in Canvas, if you go to here we are, Lab Zero Orientation, and I'm going to make it come into existence right now. Bing. Okay, so this now exists for you in your Canvas module. And this is basically something that got published um, a, about a year, a little over a year ago. And probably useful given like college is when you tend to do a lot of drinking. <laughs> um, you, it says L-cysteine containing vitamins. L-cysteine is just an amino acid. L-cysteine containing vitamin supplement which prevents or alleviates alcohol-related hangover symptoms, nausea, headache, stress, and anxiety. And here the abstract is just kind of in a nutshell what they did. You know, it says alcohol-related hangover symptoms, nausea, headache, stress, and anxiety cause globally considered amount of health problems, economic loss. Many of these are harmful effects of caused by alcohol and its metabolite. Aim of the study is to investigate the effect of the amino acid L-cysteine, on these related after effects. Here it talks about basically volunteers were recruited. They had so double blind placebo controlled. Placebo means they're just basically given a sugar cap tablet versus the actual L cysteine. You know, so that way they can compare. Some, and we'll talk more about experimental, double blind experimental design later. For right now, um, if you don't know the, the details of double blind, don't worry. Just know that it's a way of controlling for placebo effects. Um, basically, there's the results. Was you know, L-cysteine, oh, it did help prevent or alleviate these symptoms here. Um, and actually, there's a little dose-dependent thing going on there in their conclusions. So what you're going to do is you're going to be in breakout rooms. I'm going to make 
put you in groups of four people. So it's going to be a chance also to get to know each other. I'm going to put just do random, random breakout rooms. So you'll just get thrown in with whoever the computer decides to throw you in with. Um, and then you just go in, you submit this as a text entry box. So this is something you are going to, again, you're not getting so many points as much as you're getting practice here. I want you to write, what is the independent variable? What was the dependent variable? State the objective. And again, the objective, I want you to write as that simple question. That is just, how does the independent variable affect the dependent variable? Or how is the dependent variable affected by the independent variable? I just want you to kind of get practice actually physically doing what we've just, I've been t t saying things, but it's always a different thing when you have to do it yourself. Um, when you're in your little breakout rooms, reach a consensus. Um, it's some of the dynamics that sometimes happen are, you know, the person who really is comfortable with the stuff just kind of takes the bull by the horns and just does it all for everybody. And then the people who are more confused kind of like, oh, just watch them do that. You know, that's not good. You know, part of, part of why we work in groups is so there's always going to be people who understand things at a deeper level and other people who are having more trouble. And the whole point is to like work together, pull each other along, reach a consensus, like don't move on. Don't write number one, what is the independent variable until you all agree. Everybody in your group should like, and if, if I'm not sure, I can tell you my, what I'm thinking. You can tell me what you're, hopefully you can reach a consensus. When you're talking back and forth with each other, that's where you really can learn things and get comfortable with the concepts. So please, I don't want to have like four different answers from the same group. I want to have each group have the same basic answers for everybody in their group. I want you all to kind of all agree like, no, okay, no, I think that that makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense to me, explain to me why it makes sense. Oh yeah, now I see. Or Oh yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, I was I was kind of confused there. So, so any questions about this? I'm gonna like just put you into little breakout rooms for the next 20 minutes. And we're gonna regroup and take a look at this. But I want you to actually have some experience just like thinking about doing this yourself rather than me telling you about what it is. And also it gives you a chance to stop hearing me yap and, and get to know each other a little bit too. But for the rest of today's lab time, or at least the time we're going to be here, I want to talk a little bit about statistics. So the reality is there's lots of randomness in the world. All right, this jumping lab I'm talking about you know, we want to, you know, compare how somebody's height or weight or calf circumference relates to how high they can jump. It's like, all right, if I measure how high you can jump, then you jump the second time, and you jump the third time and a fourth time, they'd all probably be different heights for the jump, right? Even just trying, what does it mean how high you can jump? Because each time you jump, it's probably going to be a little different, right? Um, so when you're trying to measure, when you're trying to get at something like that, or you know, is how do we, you know, and it's hard to deal with random. The data is kind of random, but we want to kind of have like, okay, how is their height related to their jump? How would we get just like one number for their jump in order to make it easier for ourselves? We get an average or a median? Yeah, we get an average, like a probably, probably we'd probably use a mean average. You know, mean average, just add up all the values and divide by the number of values. Right. Um, you know, so you 
you get some number, you know, the, the actual value of jumps. Some of the jumps were actually a little higher, some were a little lower. We're gonna say that that average jump, average of those jumps is kind of like our true value that we're kind of oscillating around. This is what we call a measure of central tendency. Um, mean average is just one way. There are other, you know, somebody just mentioned median. Median, like, you know, the median, median home price in Marin County has been, what is me, median is just half the values are higher, half the values are lower. There's mode averages. There's, there's different ways to get measure of central tendency. But in our class, we'll usually just, you know, add and divide by the number of, of, of sample points. Um, that being said, that spread, how, how good of a measure is this in terms of actually giving us a sense of what we want to know? Depends how tightly spread out the actual data points are. So this is called measures of dispersion. Like how, so the actual data is not the actual average, but we can say like, how tightly does the actual data cluster around the, that mean average? You know, if, if the actual data points are really spread out, then that mean average isn't really a great representative of what I'm really interested in. Whereas if the, spread of the actual data points are really tight, like that dispersion is very low, then that's that mean average is giving us a good sense of something real. Here, for an example. We'll go back to the coffee drinkers, but instead we're just gonna like, instead of doing a scatter plot, we're just gonna have one group for the coffee drinkers. and the non-coffee drinkers. Here I'm gonna use categories. If I use categories, I'm gonna use a bar chart. That's gonna be my test score. And this is going to be my average. So if I look at my average test score, let's just say for the coffee drinkers, it was 92. And the non-coffee drinkers, it was 86 or something. So if I just look at this, it looks like, well, it looks like the coffee drinkers did, did a bit better than the non-coffee drinkers. It's like, how much do you trust that that's true, right? Because there's randomness, right? There's randomness in the world. If I just took a random person, they are probably gonna do better or worse on our exam, just depending on how they're feeling that day. They're gonna do better or worse. If I just pull random people out of the class, doesn't matter whether they drink coffee or not, some people are just gonna be better students than other people. So there's gonna be, I wanna know how much can I trust that this difference in my coffee drinking group, which this says on average was a little better than the non-coffee drinker group, what other information would I know, would I need to know to trust that this difference between the groups is due to some real effect of coffee and not just due to the randomness of population? Other variables? Mm -hmm. No? 
Well, you would need to know what kind of students those people are like with like at their baseline without coffee. Not so much more. We, we want to see the measure of dispersion. How spread out was if I looked at the range of data that I used to derive that, that, um, that average from, and the data was really tight around that. Like, you know, pretty much all the coffee drinkers did good and clustering around 92, but all in a pretty tight little cluster. And the non-coffee drinkers at a lower average and the data that we used to get that average was clustered tight around there. We'd say, oh, that difference between those two means is probably real. Is like it more is more likely to be real at least. Um, if instead I looked at the range of the data that we got, like both of these had scores up and down from failing to passing, but when you averaged it out, this ended up averaging off a little higher than this one. You know, I could say. Sure, the on average, this group was slightly better, but if I look at the data, how spread out it was, I don't trust that that difference is meaningful at all. I think that is just, you know, if I take, you know, half the class, no matter what, half the class, the average is going to be different between one group and the other group. And it's not, you know, so I would say this is just due to the randomness of just grabbing 20 different people. And it's not about the coffee or the non-coffee. Does that make sense, kind of? So when you're trying to decide, in fact, when you, like one of the classic um, statistics you calculate is like the student's T. It will basically say, you give it what is the average of these two groups. You give it the spread around that average. In that case, if you've taken more formal statistics, you use, you use the standard deviation, um, which just tells you kind of how spread out is the data around there. And then based upon how different these means are, how spread out the data is around the means, it will calculate and it will give you some probability. So statistics. tells you probability that the difference is real rather than just due to randomness. So before I do this, say the next thing, I wanna make sure everybody kind of understands what I mean here. Right, I have these two groups, the non-coffee drinkers, the coffee drinkers. When I looked at the coffee drinkers on average, they had a slightly higher test score than the non-coffee drinkers. I wanna know whether that effect seems to be real. It's actually, yeah, in general, coffee drinkers do better than non-coffee drinkers. Or is it just randomness of, you know, people are never gonna all get, you know, if people have different random like test taking. And if I grabbed, did the experiment again, it would be something different, right? And depending on, I can draw another picture. Right, if I had a group like this, where the means were really different and the range of data, the dispersion around the means was really tight, I'd say that looks like those two groups really are different. Whereas if I have a situation where the means are actually pretty close to each other and the data is really spread out wide around those, I'd say like, uh, I don't trust it. Yeah, sure, these are slightly different, but I don't think this is telling us anything interesting. Whereas this, 
means are really different and the data is tight around those means, this is probably telling me there is some real difference between these groups. Now, Professor, if if the the means on one group was uh, tightly clustered and not so on the other one, mm -hmm. how would you would you trust that information? So you put it into this formula. You okay. calculate this statistic, and the statistic tells you the probability. How likely is it that this difference is due to a real effect rather than just due to randomness? So there is a formal statistic you calculate. Depending on the, the structure of the experiment, there can be different ones. Like the simplest one is the student t-test um, to look to see, are these two groups just two, this, is this the this, this same population, but just a, slightly random versions out of the same group? Or does it actually look like it's out of two different groups? And the reason I'm going into this, wait a second. What is going on? Okay, the reason I'm going into this is 95% confidence. In the, the current, the current um, convention that is shifting a bit actually in science is whenever you do an experiment, you never get truth. Truth is in the realm of religion and morals and things. You never, science will never give you some absolute truth tablets handed down, you know, carved in gold or something. It's telling you, okay, we looked at the world, the world is messy. Um, how likely is it that this effect we're seeing is real rather than just due to the randomness, messiness of the world? Um, in the current, the current convention in scientific publication, if you do the calculation and the calculation says that it's 95% confidence or better that this effect is real and not just due to randomness, then you can publish it and say that it is significant. We say this is significant. Significant in the, when we're talking about statistics means something different than the more casual use of it. It means that you've done the math and the math said that we have a 95% or better chance that this effect is real and not due to randomness. So when people publish scientific results and say, we, we found such and such, you know, they don't mean it's true. They mean that due to the math that it's 95% or better chance of being true. Which also means on the flip side that there's like a one out of 20 chance that we're wrong. Which is also something important to remember. Like in, that's why science is a continual process. It's always kind of our best understanding. And as we get more data, and we get more ways of looking at things, you know, the stories can change. Um, so does this make sense, what I mean by this 95% confidence? It does. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, I mean, this I'm always feel, especially over the last few years where the, to the last of us, you know, it was like, we'll make up, you know, it's our own science, our own data. And it's like, you know, our, you know, we make up our own facts. Yeah. So I don't want people to like not think about science. Science is an incredibly powerful, useful tool for trying to understand the world. Um, but it is also, you know, important to know that, you know, there is randomness and that it isn't, it's telling you the likelihood of something. Um, and one of the things that people have found is because 
just the nature of the world where you kind of publish. You know, in reality, you should do an experiment again and make sure you're still getting the same results. But instead, people are moving on to their next thing or people aren't going to confirm somebody else's work. They're going to try to find their own research that's going to get their publication so they get tenure from their lab or whatever. Um, so they, they, there have been some issues where people have gone back and looked at things that were published and never quite revisited, you know, and double checked. And does it really hold up if you go back and check it out? And it doesn't always hold up. So that's, I think that's important to remember. Just because something is significant doesn't mean it's true, but it means it's likely true. And if a lot of people do the same experiment or are getting the same roles, then it's much more or more likely to be true. I, I'll talk about this more later, but you know, there's some like some stuff around, you know, some recommendations about diet and some disease might or might not be true. And in fact, when we get into the literature, you're gonna find conflicting reports around things. You know, when we get into bigger things of like, you know, is kind of human behavior changing the climate in like negative ways, you know, it's very, 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 very likely true, right? <laughs> so it's like, um, you know, probabilities are different depending on what thing you're looking at. So, but just kind of putting that out there, because I think sometimes people get into this idea of science as a more of a religion, telling you the truth. You do the experiment and find out what's true about the world, but it's not. It's, it's telling you good information. This is our best and most responsible interpretation of what it means amidst the randomness of things. Um, yes, there's type one and type two errors can accept an untrue hypothesis. That's one problem. And you can reject a true hypothesis. These are like the type one and type two errors. They're both, they're both dangers. They both can happen. Um, because we're just using these statistics to give us probabilities. And it's like, yeah, it is 19 out of 20 that it actually is true. So I'm going to accept it, but I was wrong. You know, or, well, I, it says like 19 out of 20 that it's not true. So I guess I can't accept it, but it was true. If I had gotten more data and gotten less noise in there, I would have seen that my effect actually is real, but it got buried in the noise in the data. So just kind of putting that out there as uh, as we're getting as we start diving into this stuff. Um, you know, and this isn't necessarily stuff you're getting tested on, but I think it's it's important as we start talking about doing science and answering questions using this this technique to like really get a sense of what it offers you and also its limitations. So, so questions about any of this? Um, so on Thursday, we'll get more into chemistry review. And we will also be um, doing that chem review lab, but unfortunately an online version. Um, and I'll talk more about what your lab notebook should look like. Um, don't write in the first, the first page of your lab notebook is a table of contents. So if you want, you can start, you can, if you have your lab manual, it tells you how to start writing your table of contents, but just make sure don't write chemistry review lab on the first page of your lab notebook because that's it's going to look bad. Um, so that's that's all I got for you. Normally expect lab 
to go till 1230, but today it's not. Um, if you have not finished either your, your discussion or your chem review quiz, please do that. Um, and otherwise, I will be hanging out if you have questions or want to ask or chat about anything. Um, but our official class is done. <laughs>